I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly Spotlight on Abortion. In what is believed to be a first, a sitting U.S. Vice President visits an abortion clinic. We're at the White House. Time to get moving. A leading Senate Republican has a message for the Speaker of the House about funding for foreign countries. Major announcement. Analysis of a decision in the United Kingdom regarding puberty blockers and children. Plus, sending a message. World leaders reach out to Pope Francis on the anniversary of the election to the pontificate. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Matilda. Our top story tonight, we begin with what may be a first, a Vice President of the United States visiting an abortion clinic. That's what Vice President Kamala Harris did today in Minnesota, a pro-abortion state. Pro-life advocates working to protect the unborn blasted today's visit while calling for more support for babies and their mothers. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, Vice President Kamala Harris has been leading the Biden administration's all-out push to fight back against pro-life measures enacted across the country ever since the fall of Roe. Now, the administration calls it the Fight for Reproductive Freedoms Tour, but pro-life advocates have a much different name for it, the Abortion Fear-Mongering Tour. Vice President Kamala Harris touring a Twin Cities Planned Parenthood clinic, getting an up-close look at the facility and speaking with staff. Well, what I saw were, I don't know, maybe two dozen healthcare workers who really care, really care about their patients. In 2023, Minnesota wrote abortion into law. It's now a state where there are no restrictions on abortion at any stage of pregnancy. It is only right and fair that people have access to the health care they need. Republican U.S. Congresswoman Michelle Fishbach of Minnesota posted on X, VP Harris visiting an abortion clinic to promote reproductive freedom is Democrat doublespeak. Ending the life of an unborn child is the exact opposite of reproducing. And SBA Pro-Life America slammed Planned Parenthood writing, as America's largest abortion business, Planned Parenthood is far from benign. While fewer and fewer cancer screenings or prenatal services are provided, they brutally ended more than 374,000 babies' lives in the last reported year and raked in over half a billion dollars from taxpayers. The vice president's trip to St. Paul, also about winning votes. President Joe Biden won that state in 2020. He's looking to win there again and across the nation in November, telling millions of Americans in his recent nationally televised State of the Union address. When reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <laughs> Now, SBA Pro-Life America also pointed out today that under the Trump-Pence administration, former Vice President Mike Pence became the first sitting vice president to visit a pregnancy resource center which supports women and their children. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Our President Biden hits the campaign trail, including a radio interview with the Black Information Network. He used the opportunity to contrast his vision for a second term with that of former President Donald Trump. The president said, quote, the past president of the United States, Trump, has a fundamentally different view of the world and the United States than I do. He thinks that we are a losing nation. The threat Trump poses is greater than ever. And what's at stake is our democracy the soul of the nation. While staying with the former president, a federal judge heard arguments from Donald Trump's lawyers today on whether charges against him for mishandling classified documents should be dismissed. The judge did not immediately rule on the bid to throw out the case before it ever reaches a jury. She did tell a Trump attorney that striking down a statute would be, quote, quite an extraordinary step. She also noted to a prosecutor that no former president has ever been charged with mishandling classified documents. A ruling is expected soon. On Capitol Hill, the fate of USAID to Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan remains up in the air for several months. House Speaker Mike Johnson has refused to take up the Senate passed $95 billion package because it lacks border security funding. Outgoing Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell says that it is time to get moving. I want to encourage the speaker again to allow a vote, a vote. Let the House speak on the supplemental that we sent 
over to them several weeks ago. We've got a bill that got 70 votes in the Senate. Give members of the House of Representatives an opportunity to vote on it. House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries says time is of the essence. The clock is ticking and we have to get the bipartisan national security bill over the finish line before we leave town next Friday, March 22nd, before we leave town. It's reckless to do otherwise. But a sizable number of House Republicans tell EWTN News Nightly that they will not support any more money for Ukraine. For me, I personally would not support additional funding into Ukraine. I think that it's been handled wrong. But the bottom line is, is that we don't have any military strategy and any business in Ukraine fighting these proxy wars. If people in Washington are willing to spend money on an issue, it should be a domestic issue first, an American issue first, before looking abroad. So right now, the situation is pretty tense. Congressman Mike Lawler, a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus, says it's time to pass the bill. Ukraine needs the support. Israel needs the support. We see the threats emanating from the unholy alliance of China, Russia, and Iran. Uh, this is the moment for America to be the leader that it is of the free world, and we need to uh, pass this bill across the finish line. Others are insisting on conditions for more aid to Israel. I would support uh, defensive aid, Iron Dome aid for Israel today, because I think that's important to protect Israelis. But what I won't do is continue to support United States offensive military aid going in to kill people in Gaza. There are also efforts to speed up the process with petitions that would force the House to vote on the Senate pass bill. Another covers a smaller $66 billion package with some border provisions. Those could be on the House floor next week. Uh, during a speech on the Senate floor today, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer called for new elections in Israel and criticized the Israeli Prime Minister for his handling of the war with Hamas. He said Netanyahu has lost his way and identified him as one of the reasons the conflict continues. The fourth major obstacle to peace is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. As a lifelong supporter of Israel, it has become clear to me the Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. The world has changed radically since then, and the Israeli people are being stifled right now by a governing vision that is stuck in the past. Senator Schumer named three other obstacles to a two-state solution, Hamas and Palestinian supporters, what he called radical Israelis and Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas. The report says that Yemen's Houthi rebels have a new hypersonic missile. The story in Russian media comes following months of aggression by Houthis targeting cargo ships in the Red Sea. The rebels have hinted for weeks about so-called surprises in their fight against the U.S. and its allies. The Houthis say that they will not stop their attacks until Israel ends its war in Gaza. For the first time since Russia's invasion of Ukraine two years ago, the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church visited the United States. EWTN News contributor Catherine Hadro sat down with him at the Ukrainian Catholic National Shrine of the Holy Family in Washington, D.C., and files this report. Catherine. Tracy, his beatitude Sviatoslav Shevchuk traveled to the U.S. last week accompanied by five bishops. His beatitude met with lawmakers and church leaders to discuss the ongoing war in Ukraine and the need to safeguard religious freedom amidst the reported persecution of Christians and territories occupied by Russian forces. This visit by his beatitude is significant as he leads the largest Eastern Catholic Church in communion with the Holy See. Our conversation ranged from the need for aid in Ukraine to to what his beatitude has seen in Kiev during the war. But one of the most moving parts of our conversation was when his beatitude reflected on how many Ukrainians right now are grappling with the question, where is God? That question is very important and deep religious questions. But God is with us. Jesus Christ today is crucified in crucified body of Ukraine. And we venerate him in the wounds of the simple people. His beatitude reiterated his gratitude to the United States for their support of Ukraine, but said that the need for more aid is urgent. He said people cannot wait a week for groceries. They need to eat today. 
something that also struck me from my interview was the fact that despite the heaviness of the topic and the tragedy of war, his beatitude had a joy and a buoyancy that was noticeable. And when I commented on this, his beatitude reminded me that joy is always a gift from the Holy Spirit. You can watch my interview with the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church tomorrow night on EWTN News in Depth at 8 p.m. Eastern. Tracy. Okay, thank you so much for that, Catherine. Well, at least two people are dead after Ukraine fired missiles into a Russian territory as part of an apparent effort by Ukraine to rattle the Kremlin ahead of presidential elections this weekend. Vladimir Putin appears set for a near certain re-election. On to Haiti now. A handful of stores reopened in the capital amid a slowdown in the recent violence that has gripped the Caribbean nation. <laughs> One man says the people should decide who will be the next leader of the Catholic country. Banks and stores reopened yesterday and public transportation resumed. Schools and gas stations remain closed. Banks had been shuttered for nearly 10 days amid a spike in gang violence that forced the conditional resignation of the prime minister. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including blocking puberty blockers. Detransitioner Ollie London discusses the recent moves to protect children in the UK. And world leaders send words of congratulations to Pope Francis. We'll explain. in Mississippi advanced a measure to block transgender recognition. The bill says biological sex is defined at birth and that every individual is either male or female. The measure now heads to the state Senate for further consideration. As we reported yesterday, the National Health Service in the United Kingdom says that it will no longer prescribe puberty blockers for children. The NHS says there is not enough evidence to support the safety nor effectiveness of puberty blockers. The treatments now will only be available as part of research trials or in some private clinics. And joining us now from London, England, is Ollie London, a UK citizen, detransitioner, and author of the book Gender Madness, One Man's Devastating Struggle with Woke Ideology and His Battle to Protect Children. Ollie, good to see you, my friend. Um, your reaction to the NHS's decision and its pivot to more holistic type of treatment for children with gender dysphoria. Well, this is a really landmark ruling because it sets the precedent for the rest of the world. We've seen that Europe and the UK now following the science and finally waking up and realizing that the long term data on puberty blockers suggests that it causes significant health concerns for children. Uh, there's not enough, you know, long term data that goes 10, 20 years down the line that tells you exactly what happens to these kids. But we do know that there is issue with bone density and bone development. Uh, when these kids are starting hormones and puberty blockers age 13. Uh, this ruling will now ban any puberty blockers for under 18s, uh, except in clinical trials. And you know, we all know that uh, kids cannot consent to these things, uh, just like a kid can't get a tattoo or smoke a cigarette. Uh, this is a common sense approach. Um, so I believe this will set the precedence for the rest of the world and hopefully America will follow suit. Yeah, we hope it will, too. And, and you mentioned the other European countries, and we've talked about that before on this show, who've kind of reversed course when it comes to so-called gender-affirming care. Why do you think that's not happening here in the United States right now? Well, we've seen uh, countries like Sweden and Finland, which were the initial pioneers in gender transitions on children uh, in Europe, they have now reversed course because their long-term data is suggesting it's not healthy, it's not the right approach, and that they should instead be treating the mental health concerns of these kids. Um, I think in the US, you know, you have a, a for-profit system where uh, doctors, medical insurance, there's a lot of money being made there. And, you know, we're seeing kids as young as 11 in certain states are uh, being prescribed puberty blockers. In some places, they can just call up a clinic and get the puberty blocker prescription over the phone. So it's truly alarming. And I think uh, in America, the medical industry is, of course, for-profit. Uh, and there's a lot of money being made in there. Ali, what are you hearing uh, over there in the UK about this decision by the NHS? What are people saying? Well, it's a very positive reaction because, you know, a lot of uh, parents, uh, kids uh, campaigning groups have been fighting for this for a very long time. And, you know, the UK saw just a few years ago only 250 children being referred to the Tavistock Clinic, which is the gender uh, transition clinic for kids. Only 250, that shot up to 5,000 kids being referred to the clinic in 2022. So 
I think people have seen that this is an alarming uh, trend. Uh, it's not a naturally occurring phenomenon. Uh, many of these kids are just doing it simply because it's become a social contagion. So I think people are awake. Uh, there's been some great responses from women's campaigners, from um, you know, MPs in the UK. And you also have the former Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who is introducing a bill to Parliament. She'll be speaking about it uh, tomorrow. Uh, basically saying that all hormones, puberty blockers and medical transitions should be prohibited for minors under the age of 18. And it's a common sense approach. It absolutely is. Ali, I mean, you obviously have your finger on the pulse of all this. What are you seeing right now? What are you following? Well, you know, I'm seeing more and more people speaking up. So in terms of the U.S., uh, in terms of women's rights and protecting uh, gender as uh, biology, obviously, we've just had the case in Mississippi. Um, you also have 16 female athletes uh, filing a lawsuit against the NCAA, which includes Riley Gaines, uh, basically saying that, you know, biological males shouldn't have the same access to women's spaces or women's sports. So we are seeing this pushback from many, many people. I think before people were afraid to speak up because, you know, nobody, nobody really is transphobic these days. Most people are very inclusive and accepting, but I think people now are speaking up because at the end of the day, it's kids' lives are being ruined with these uh, medical experiments. Women are losing their rights. So I think we're seeing a lot more people feeling the confidence to speak up and you know that's how it should be absolutely and thank you ali for speaking up as always great to have you on god bless god bless Ple my pleasure thank you up next on ewtn news nightly a trip to the movies dr paul kangor joins us to discuss his review of the new movie cabrini plus pope francis highlights some themes for discussion ahead of october's session of the synod on synodality review of the movie Cabrini says the film delivers beautiful imagery of Rome and the Vatican and the cinematography scenery and use of the Italian language are very well done but the movie also is quote utterly gutted of religious meaning writing in the American Spectator this week Dr. Paul Kangor says in part quote the film could have been easily salvaged at multiple junctures if just once in one of her many dark night of the soul moments, this mother Cabrini could have turned to a crucifix, pleaded to Jesus, and prayed. Alas, she doesn't. And the author of that piece, Dr. Paul Kangor, joins us now. He's also a professor of political science at Grove City College in Pennsylvania. Dr. Kangor, good to see you as always. Um, good to see you, Tracy. Thank you. You know, you titled this article on the movie Gutting Jesus, Feminist Cabrini, Secular Saint. Um, that said, it's pretty obvious that you don't think this is a religious movie. Talk to us more about that. Yeah. And, you know, let me start off by saying some nice things, right, which, which you quoted. Um, I love the cinematography. I, I mean, I'm actually, my mother, Tracy, is 100% Italian, so people wouldn't know from my Polish last name. In fact, my DNA test says I'm 55 to 65% Calabrian. My grandfather on my mother's side actually came over in exactly the period on the boat as a stowaway, uh, jumped into the Hudson River. Uh, it, it came over in the same period identified at the start of the Cabrini movie. So I love the Italian imagery. I love the imagery of New York. According to the executive producer, 39% of the dialogue is, is in Italian. Uh, so let me add two Italian words to this. Uh, if Mother Cabrini was watching this film today, she would probably have said, Dove Gesù? Where's Jesus? <laughs> Jesus is not mentioned in this film about a saint even one time. And, and at first I thought, am I missing something? But now I've read several other reviews and other reviewers have said, you know, I don't recall seeing Jesus mentioned even one time. E even when they do the rare prayer, which is a grace, a dinner grace with Mother Cabrini and the sisters, they say it in Latin, right? Uh, they say, uh, uh, blessed, uh, but for these thy gifts which we are about to receive, amen. They don't even say through Christ our Lord, amen. Um, so multiple times, I'll tell you one more. The um, I noticed that the orphanage is originally called in the movie the Holy Angels Orphanage. Actually, Cabrini's orphanage was originally called the Sacred Heart Orphanage because these are the mothers of the Sacred Heart. That's the Sacred Heart of Jesus. They even took literally the Sacred Heart of Jesus off the name of the orphanage in the beginning. So I just, I, I thought um, this is quite a sub omission to 
Uh, everything that Mother Cabrini did was about her Jesus. Everything, 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 everything. And this movie stripped every single mention of Jesus out of it. And I find that, you know, honestly appalling, frankly. Paul, you know, do you think if this movie portrayed, you know, more of Mother Cabrini's prayer life, if it was more religious or more Catholic, um, do you think it would have the same appeal? I, I do, and, and and this is what what I find really striking about it. I know they want to appeal to the modern culture, the secular audiences, but uh, you know, Tracy, which secular person is going to go to that movie and not expect a sainted Catholic nun to pray a couple times, right? To mention Jesus a couple of times, and, and you kind of wait at various times. I mean, she has multiple sort of what filmmakers call dark night of the soul moments. And I'm just waiting. I'm, I'm sitting there with my wife in the movie theater saying, when is she going to pray? Right? When is she going to pray? Where is she in front of a crucifix pleading? But every time she sort of goes to herself, right? Her, her womanhood. I mean, this is really, it's like a feminist movie. I mean, it is all about you watch the trailer of it, um, Angel Studios has put out a trailer where Shania Twain is singing, all right? I feel like a woman, right? Uh, so it, it's it's very much um, coming from that angle, that direction. It's really not a very religious movie. Yeah. Paul, let me ask you this, though. Um, do you think it could work to help to bring more people into the faith, though, presenting it this way? I, I mean, I, I hope so. But on the other hand, I just find it so striking that you could completely gut it of so much religious significance and completely gut it of any mentions of Jesus and so little prayer. Now, hopefully, and I know the filmmakers are thinking, hopefully the filmmakers are thinking, maybe, maybe they're thinking this, uh, that uh, people will go and do more research on Mother Cabrini and maybe see her religious side. But I still think that you can that you can include that religious side, which animated and inspired everything that she did. I mean, I saw an EWTN a few years ago, a Mother Cabrini movie, film, um, Italian, just, of course, loaded with religion. Now, th these filmmakers of this film would probably say that that was too much, but you can have a little, right? Uh, you know, un po, as the Italians say, right? A little, a tiny bit, <laughs> right? One mention of Jesus, you know, one deep moment of prayer. One, just one, in a, in a movie that's over, well over two hours long. Nothing, none of that. Yeah. Well, Paul, I'm going to give you a little bit of Italian here. Mi familia, part of my family, is also from Calabria, too. So that's one more thing you and I have in common, and I enjoy Beautiful, seeing Italy. Beautiful, right. Yeah. So. That and our Pittsburgh th that's right. as well. <laughs> All right, Paul, thank you so much for weighing in. Great to talk with you, as always. All right. Thanks, Tracy. Ciao. Ciao. All right, well, two more documents on the Synod were presented this morning in the Vatican. Pope Francis also sent a letter to the Synod Secretary with suggestions on topics that will need to be examined further. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser has more. Good evening, Tracy. Today, the events at the Vatican brought us one step closer to the October Synod. Cardinal Mario Gregg received a letter from Pope Francis regarding the Synod on Synodality. It outlined 10 discussion points to the Secretary General, and among them were the relationship between the Eastern Catholic Churches and the Roman Latin Church, the mission of the Church in the digital environment, and how the Church can best listen to the cry of the poor. Now, smaller study groups will examine these discussion points ahead of the 2024 session and will be working on it even after the conclusion of the Synod. Pope Francis wanted an ample amount of time for his suge suggestions to be studied and properly examined. He also insisted that the second part of the Synod should not only be about these topics. Other points touch on the relationship between bishops, consecrated life, and ecclesial associations, as well as the priestly formation. There will be some controversial topics for the study groups as well. Among the most notable was what one of the documents today presented calls the possible access of women to the diaconate. At today's press conference at the Holy See Press Office, Cardinals Mario Gregg and Jean-Claude Hollerich presented the findings of the first synodal session from last year and a preparatory document for next October titled How to be a Synodal Church in Mission. At the end of the conference, the Relator General of the Synod, Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich, told EWTN News that synodality is meant for the whole Church and emphasized the importance of mission. We do not want to polarize. We want to bring people together. 
And I think we have succeeded in the first, uh, last year in October, and we have to act very wisely to continue uh, that process. So it's important that synodality is not just for progressive church. Synodality is for the whole church. It gives life to the church. It centers the church again on mission. And we all know that we need to proclaim Christ to the world. In the coming months, we will continue reporting about new developments leading up to October when bishops from all around the world will gather again here at the Vatican. In Rome, Andreas Townhauser, EWTN News Nightly. Well, finally tonight, reaction poured in from officials and leaders around the world congratulating Pope Francis on the 11th anniversary of his election to the pontificate. Those who sent messages include U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Putin says the Holy Father is, quote, one of the few leaders with an honest strategic vision of world problems. Other leaders from Taiwan and Azerbaijan congratulated Pope Francis and praised the work that he has done to seek peace and to fight human trafficking. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.